Hello, my name is Dr. Joseph McHale. I am the Chief Medical Officer of the International Myeloma Foundation, and I'm a professor at the Translational Genomics Research Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. It's my absolute pleasure today to share with you uh, the data that we were just able to present as a late breaking abstract at the European Hematology Association meeting, the IKEMA study, which is a study that compares the new drug esetuximab with carfilzomib and dexamethasone versus dexamethasone, uh, uh, carfilzomib and dexamethasone alone in um, relapsed multiple myeloma. This was a large phase three trial, and I'll share with you some of the data and indeed what it means for us in the myeloma community. So esetuximab is a drug that we've come to get to know a little bit better recently. It's very similar to daratumumab in that it's a drug that targets the CD38 antigen, or this thing that sticks out of a myeloma cell called CD38, and it can immediately destroy the cell, but also recruit parts of the immune system to also help destroy the cell. It's one of the things that differentiates it a little bit from daratumumab. It hooks onto a different epitope, as we call it, or a different part of the CD38 and can actually directly, as we call it, direct apoptosis or apoptotic activity uh, where it can destroy the cell directly. The study of 300 patients was designed as a large phase three study to compare esetuximab carfilzomib dex to carfilzomib dex alone. I'll talk at the end about why I think this is so important, but this was a, a very large study where, as you can see here, uh, we have many patients in both treatment arms uh, with the objective of seeing the progression-free survival uh, compared in these two arms. Um, the patients who entered the study were really quite balanced between the two arms. A couple of things to note, though, that a quarter of these patients have high-risk myeloma. We know that around a quarter of myeloma patients do have myeloma, um, and so that they are included in the study is very important because many studies don't include as many high-risk patients for various reasons. And we see, of course, that uh, so many of these patients um, had uh, indeed previously been treated with uh, lenalidomide, uh, which will become important as I explain the concept of the study a little bit later. So when we look at these patients in what was called a three to two randomization, that's why you see about 179 in the ESA arm and 123 in, in just the carfilzomib arm, uh, many more patients in carfilzomib had been discontinued uh, because of progressive disease. Uh, and this had a follow-up of uh, nearly 21 months. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but importantly, um, in the esetuximab carfilzomib arm, only 37% had progressed, whereas 54% had progressed in the carfilzomib dex arm. This is really probably the most important slide. If I'm only allowed to show one, I would show this one, that we see that the progression-free survival hasn't been met yet or hasn't been reached yet in the esetuximab arm, but was about 19 months in the a carfilzomib arm, and this provides some, one of the ways that we can evaluate how significant the differences between these two arms is what's called the hazard ratio, and here the hazard ratio is 0.53, which means there is a 47% reduction in progression or death in patients that received esetuximab plus carfilzomib versus just carfilzomib alone. We saw this benefit really across all groups, independent of age, prior treatments, uh, even cytogenetic risk status. The second maybe very important thing out of this study, not only do we see an improvement in progression-free survival, but we saw a difference in response, especially in the very deep responses. If you look here on the right-hand side of the MRD rate uh, in patients uh, who went to MRD negativity or no detectable disease in the intention to treat analysis, you have about 30% versus 13%. So really adding esetuximab to carfilzomib really provided that deeper response. It also prolonged uh, the time to someone needing their next treatment quite significantly, and again, still haven't reached that exact date, but we can see uh, the difference between these two curves. Now, it's obviously a little bit early to identify any difference between overall survival in these subgroups, uh, in these two groups, because of course, we have lots of options to give patients after they've had uh, these two treatments. Uh, when we look at how long people are on treatment, uh, we see about a 20-week uh, lengthening of being on treatment with esetuximab carfilzomib dex versus carfilzomib uh, dex alone. 
And thankfully, uh, although uh, every drug comes with risk and toxicity, it was generally very well uh, tolerated. Nothing that was surprising out of what we would have expected. We look at the discontinuation rate uh, because of having an adverse event actually being higher in the carfilzomib uh, dex uh, alone arm. And then we look at what sorts of things happened. We have to always be careful with carfilzomib, make sure that there weren't any significant differences in the cardiac uh, failure of any class. And here we see that it was really quite balanced between the two arms, no major differences. And we see the kinds of things that we expect with esotuximab, some infusional reactions that are almost always just the first or second infusion and usually very mild, really quite controllable. There's nothing really here that surprised us you know, I had a privilege of being a part of this study and indeed nothing really surprised us in that. So when Dr. Moreau presented uh, this data uh, very recently at the virtual EHA meeting, he concluded as we all did as investigators that the study met its primary endpoint with a significant improvement in progression-free survival, the hazard ratio of 0.53, meaning as we said, a 47% reduction in the risk of progression and death. That we saw this across all subgroups. We saw a significant deepening of response, especially of MRD negativity of 30% versus 13%. And that really this occurred in a way that was safe uh, and, and that we could manage and was typical of what we would see uh, in these um, uh, using these drugs. Uh, we had participation from multiple countries around the world and uh, very thankful for that. So in my last couple of minutes, let me help us understand how this fits in to the profile of myeloma care. The majority of patients right now, especially in the US, will get a bortezomib lenalidomide dex start to their treatment, and then uh, may or may not go to transplant, and then typically go on to lenalidomide maintenance. Not everybody can stay on lenalidomide maintenance forever, of course, but people stay on it until their progression. And then we have a decision to make. What do we treat with a patient? We see that now we're incorporating monoclonal antibodies much more at that first relapse, usually now with daratumumab. So we can often use daratumumab with pomalidomide or maybe with bortezomib if they're progressing on lenalidomide. But now we have two very large important studies, the Candor study and this study, the Ikema study, that shows that we can combine daratumumab with carfilzomib as well as esituximab with carfilzomib. And it's very attractive to use this combination because we're changing classes the patients are usually progressing on lenalidomide, so an immunomodulatory drug. So to switch classes to a monoclonal antibody that they've not seen before and a novel proteasome inhibitor with carfilzomib is very attractive. There's gonna be a lot of discussion comparing these two studies and it's too early to make any significant comparisons. These two drugs are very similar and it's hard to say that one is better than the other. We still have to understand that sequencing. But using our best treatments early on is the trend in myeloma. And we know that carfilzomib is very potent. And to combine it with a monoclonal antibody here uh, shows us that these two drugs can be very potent together. We will likely be using more daratumumab and ultimately esituximab even in frontline therapy. Uh, but for now, this uh, remains an excellent choice at first relapse. We hope this is helpful to you as you understand all the wonderful data that has been presented at ASCO and EHA over these last few weeks and how we incorporate it into our practice. Thanks very much.